Today I serve as a board member of Respectability. I would like to introduce our three speakers, who will each represent parts of the work they co-authored, along with Philip Pauli, who is in the audience. I would also like to thank Lauren Applebaum and David Perry for editorial assistance with the paper. After the panelists speak, they will take questions from you in the audience. Please notice that there is a live captioning on the screen here. For those of you who would like it. <laughs> the first speaker is Jennifer Laszlo Mizrahi. She's the president of Respectability, a nonprofit organization working to empower people with disabilities to achieve the American dream. She has published more than 100 articles on disability issues, has met with 43 American governors on employment for people with disabilities, and is a vocal champion for the one in five Americans who have a disability. This left herself. She also knows what it means to parent children with multiple disabilities. Our second speaker is Eddie B. Evans, Jr. As a Washingtonian native and a reading tree advocate consultant, trainer, mentor, and motivational speaker, as a returning citizen with a disability, Ellis's experience provides invaluable insight and depth into his work that allows him to connect with and engage the community in which he serves. He is the founder and CEO of One by One, an organization that works with communities and partners to provide youth development workshops and mentoring services to keep youth out of the correction system and help those exiting the system stay out. Ellis has also written and published several resources, guides, in offering service referrals, practical tips, and inspiration to former offenders and parolees and trained in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. He works hard to ensure that in individuals re-entering society are well-informed and sufficiently equipped to make better choices for themselves and that they are truly given a second chance. The actual recommendations for the white paper are laid out by G. L. Jeffers and Jeffers of Jefferson Associates, LLC. She served as Executive Deputy Director for the Federal DC Interagency Task Force at the White House, OMB, and also served as policy advisor for the President's National the President's Crime Prevention Task Force Council. From 1992 to 1996, she was the chief of the National Office of Citizen Participation of Federal Bureau of Prisons at the Department of Justice. And from 1985 to 1991, she was the deputy commissioner for the New York City Department of Correction, rising through the ranks to become the first civilian to achieve that position. So let me start by just talking about why this topic. Why is this so very, very important? The first of all is that one out of every, only 5% of the world lives in America, but 25% of the world's incarcerated population is in America. So we're talking about 2.2 million people that are currently um, incarcerated in, in America, and this is a 500% increase in people who were incarcerated over the last 30 years. And interestingly, Janie Jeffords and I worked on criminal justice issues um, decades ago, and we presented at a panel literally uh, 22 years ago, I looked at it because it was on C-SPAN, um, where Janie was predicting exactly this increase and exactly what was going to happen uh, 22 years ago based on the policies that people were voting for. And so this is really um, a huge issue and we have to recognize that this disproportionately impacts people of color, that 60% of people in prison are now racial and ethnic minorities. And there's been a lot of attention to the fact of the racial lens um, in the justice issue, but not to the disability, um, not to the disability issues. Um, but we have to recognize that one out of every three American adults now has a criminal record. That's one out of every three. And that 10 million of Americans' children have experienced parental incarceration at some point in their lives. And this weekend, as many of us celebrated Father's Day, there were many American children whose fathers were behind bars. Yet three quarters of the people 
who leave, and by the way, 95% of the people who are currently incarcerated eventually will leave, 95% will leave, but a really big challenge is that the system is so broken that fully three quarters of them will be rearrested and two thirds of them will be reincarcerated sometime within five years, three quarters. So this is clearly a very broken system. I know that there's been a lot of focus also on costs. We're talking about a system that costs $80 billion a year, but I would really put forward that the cost is way greater than the $80 billion because you've got the lost productivity of 2.2 million Americans who are currently incarcerated. So what do we need to know that's going to help us do things differently? Because as I said, Jamie and I were on a panel um, 22 years ago. What's going to change that it isn't going to be worse um, decades from now? And what is it that we really have to know? So by coincidence, I happened to watch a, a great movie last night called The Big Short. I don't know if any of you have seen The Big Short, but it's about the housing bubble in America. And there were some really interesting things about it. One is that all the data and all the facts that there was going to be a, a collapse were all there with publicly available data. It's just that people weren't looking in the right place with the right lens. And so it's very important to, to think about this Mark Twain quote, which they use, which it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Hmm. And I really do think that when we think about criminal justice, that people are very sure about a lot of things where they're missing very important components that would dramatically change the outcomes um, of how the system works so that we can make things for the better. Whenever I look at public policy, I always look at the theory of change. What is it that you're going to do that is gonna make that engine of progress move forward? And I like to think of it as a steam engine. A steam engine only moves when you hit boiling point because it requires a steam which means that it won't move until the water is 212 degrees. We have a lot of policies that might get us to 50 degrees, to 100 degrees, but they're not getting us to the 212 degrees to move forward, to make progress, to reduce the recidivism rate, and to re reduce the indignity and human injustices that are happening in the system. So we really have to look at the theory of change. It's the A plus B plus C equals D. Now what are you going to do with the different elements of public policy that are going to give us a different and better outcome? Because it's not just about recognizing the facts, and we have a lot of facts in this document. It's about what do we need to do differently to get a better outcome? And when we look at that theory of change, that blueprint of what it is that needs to be done, you can really test, you should be able to test the best practices and see are you getting the better outcomes or are you just spinning your wheels and giving sound bites for the camera but actually making things even worse. You should be able to test public policy and you really can to see if you were to spend more money on doing something, would that make things better? If you were to cut spending money on something, would that make things worse? So it's very, very important to have testable hypotheses and to be sure that we're moving things forward because what we do know for a fact is that things are getting much, much worse. Now, when you look at the pathways or the cycle of justice involvement, I would like to thank the ARC, and there's some people from the ARC who are here for this model. It shows the different um, sort of timeline of the first contact in the community, the investigation, the jail, the trial, the plea, the agreement, the transition in the community, all the different times when you need to take into a to account disability issues when you think about criminal um, justice reform issues. So how many people are we talking about? So it's actually very difficult to pin down a number. One of our key recommendations is for better data. Um, we do see a lot of studies that say that the majority of prisoners are people who have mental health differences, that the majority of incarcerated inmates have addiction issues, but there are many other issues that people don't talk about that are incredibly, incredibly important. And in many cases, 
predate and are causal to mental health issues or to addiction issues. So 32% of people in prison report having at least one disability, 40% of those in jail. It totals up to over three quarters of a million people who have disabilities who are behind bars. So what are the different disabilities? First of all, I'm very pleased that we have a screen reader in back of me that people who are hearing impaired can follow what we're saying because there are literally approximately 150,000 people who are currently incarcerated who are either deaf or hearing impaired. There are literally 150,000 people that are incarcerated that are either blind or have vision impairments and you have this very large number of people, 500,000, with cognitive impairments. And we're going to talk a lot more about cognitive in, uh, impairments because I think that in all the research that we did, that this was, to me, the most interesting fact that was new of all the data that we saw. Self-care is also very important in independent living. People who would use a wheelchair have mobility issues. People who have multiple disabilities would fall into those categories. And so we're talking very large numbers of people, not just one or two anecdotes, but 750,000 people. And we have to understand that disability is very non-discriminatory in that it impacts people of all races, genders, you know, backgrounds, and that 51% of Americans have a loved one with a disability or are a person with a disability themselves. One in five Americans has a disability. One in five, that's 20% of our population. And we have to understand the definition of disability. A disability is an impairment that impacts something important to your daily living. So it can't be you know, something really small that doesn't impact your daily living. It has to be very significant to, to count. Um, but it doesn't have to be something that you can visually observe. And this is one of the big problems in incarceration is people with cognitive disabilities, because you can't see them, people think that they are faking it. There is a lot of misunderstanding around the non-visible disabilities. People can see if you're blind or you're deaf or you use a wheelchair, but if you have a cognitive disability, they can't see the disability. Um, and it's very, very important to recognize how those impact everything as we think about the criminal justice process. And I want to give a case study that everyone will be familiar, I'm sure, with the story of Freddie Gray, who tragically was killed while he was in police custody. But how did he get to the point that he was in police custody? A young African-American man who lived in a house with lead paint, he developed these cognitive disabilities. He did not have the ability to follow multi-step instructions. This is a disability called an executive function disorder that happens frequently from lead paint poisoning or from lead water, as we will see in Flint, Michigan, sadly, in the years ahead. And what that means is that frequently people throughout his life thought that he had defiance because he didn't follow multi-step instructions. But the issue wasn't that he wasn't wanting to follow instructions, it's that he couldn't. And what is so very, very important is to understand that when you have a young child with these kinds of disabilities, they can learn and their brains can literally rewire. Literally, brains can rewire in children to overcome certain things. And I'll give you an example. As a parent, um, one of my children who's a stroke survivor, when she was younger, she could not hear and move at the same time. Her brain could only process one or the other at the same time. She could hear fine, she could move fine, she could not do them at the same time. But because of early intervention, she can do both extremely well. Um, and that is really, really important to understand that brains are rewiring until an individual is 21 years old. But if it is not addressed because they didn't diagnose it and it didn't get the early accommodations, the brain fixes and those disabilities are lasting. And it has a lot of impacts in terms of why people like Freddie Gray wind up getting killed. Because if somebody says to, an, to somebody who looks suspicious, put your hands on your head, turn around, and drop to the ground, that is a three-step 
instruction. And somebody can get confused and put their hands on their hips, causing the police to think that they are reaching for a weapon. So more than a third of the individuals who've been killed by the police are individuals with disabilities, more than a third. And this is an a disability that impacts things tremendously inside prison because there's a lot of complex instructions that prisons, prisoners are given where they don't give them visual cl cues by putting them in pictures. And I'm going to give you an example of, of that. Um, if you go to Starbucks, um, you can see that there are instructions that you should wash your hands. And there are actually pictures in how to wash hands. There are people who need pictures to learn and to follow instructions. And by offering something as an accommodation, as simple as showing a picture of the expectation, you can get the desired outcome. But without the picture, the individual literally cannot follow the instructions. So this is an accommodation that is very important, as you'll hear from Janie. In our white paper, you'll see that there's a glossary with a lot of terms. And there's a lot of people here who work either in corrections or criminal justice, or you work on disability. There aren't too many people who work on both. I'd like to highlight a couple terms. Ableism is the idea that people with disabilities are somehow less than people without disabilities. And there's tremendous stigma around disabilities. You'll see in the popular movie, uh, Me Before You, where the happy ending of the movie is that the individual who has multiple disabilities commit suicide because it's better to be dead than to live with disabilities. Ableism is very pervasive throughout all of America. It is particularly a problem inside minority communities because people who already have one minority feel they're already being persecuted or looked down on because they are African American or Hispanic. They're not looking to add another label that might cause there to be another ism towards them. And so this is something that we really see. Another term that I think is particularly important is intersectionality. Intersectionality is when you have the combination of racism and ableism together, or sexism, or for people from the LBGTQ community who also have disabilities. There are tremendous overlaps that you really have to take a look at that impact things in so many different ways. And we'll go back to the fact that 32% of people in prison, 40% of those in jail self-report a disability, 95% eventually will leave, but within five years, three out of four of them will be back incarcerated again. So what are some of the antecedents? Sexual abuse of children is known to be a precursor of committing sexual abuse later. Um, this is a very important issue. I myself am dyslexic. I could not read or write until I was at least 12. I was not diagnosed until I was 14. Faced tremendous bullying, tremendous bullying. Had very low self-esteem. And when I was 12, I trusted somebody at school and wound up being raped. This is unbelievably common. Unbelievably common. It is happening across our nation all the time. Children with disabilities are three times more likely to be victims of rape or sexual assault than children without disabilities. And it keeps happening when they are adults. So every nine minutes, an adult with a disability is sexually assaulted. And for half of the individuals with cognitive disabilities, by the time they're adults, they've been sexually assaulted on average 10 times or more. 10 times or more. People with disabilities, not surprisingly, um, are twice as likely also to be victims of other kinds of crime than people without disabilities. And a third, as I mentioned in the Freddie Gray case, of all use of force incidents with um, the police are with disabled civilians. 67% of those who are in state prisons have failed to complete high school. There is a tremendous correlation between failure to complete high school and going into the justice system. People with disabilities who do not get um, you know, their accommodations, I mean, who hasn't fixed these uh, degrees? 59% of them have a speech disability, 66% learning disability. You, know, you have these very significant correlation between disability and failure to achieve a high school diploma. And in fact, if you look at 
who finishes high school in America, on average, 81, 80 to 81% complete high school. And you can see that for African Americans, it's only 69%, but for people with a disability, it's only 61%. But if you are African American or Hispanic and you have a disability, the likelihood that you will complete high school is very small, and the likelihood that you will wind up being incarcerated increases and increases. As I said, there's a 20-point gap between people with and without disabilities in high school obtainment. And very important to think about school suspensions. And this, a lot of it goes to these non-visible disabilities. It's the individuals who have the executive function disorder for whom their teachers think that they are being defiant because they're not following multi-step instructions and suspend them when in fact they should have been given their instructions one at a time or also in a visual format that wind up being suspended. And once a child is suspended, their likelihood of not completing school goes up tremendously. And I know there's been some important work in this committee, the health committee, on school suspensions, and we really think it's deeply important. But as Eric Jacobson said, boys of colors are diagnosed with behavioral disorders while white kids get diagnosed with autism. And there is tremendous disparity um, uh, in that African American, Hispanic, and other minority children are not getting the diagnosis that they need, and they are getting suspended, and they are failing to complete school. These are the kinds of uh, disabilities that people have in school, and you'll see, if you to de dig even deeper, the disparity in race in terms of, um, you know, who's getting the right individual education plan done for them. And also, once the plan is done, the school system doesn't always implement the plan, and parents had to advocate for those children. Some of you may have seen the movie Dory over the weekend, and you see these great disability themes, and you see the parent who's really trying to do the scaffolding, the teaching of the skills, um, so that um, so that people can, well, in this case, fish, can be successful. The truth is that that needs to happen for children also, that they need to have those accommodations so they can build those skills and scaffolding so they'll be independent and they'll be successful. And you can really see what kinds of disabilities exist in our population. Cognitive disabilities are what's most prevalent in America's children amongst people with disabilities. Um, and there's also obviously college gaps, and there every year 300,000 Americans with disabilities graduate or leave the school system, far too few um, with a diploma, 300,000. Um, only one in three working age Americans with disabilities has any job, one out of every three. There's 22 million Americans with disabilities, only one in three has a job. I'll just mention that 400,000 of those who have a job are working in sheltered workshops where it's legal to pay sub-minimum wage. So not surprisingly, people with disabilities are the poorest of the poor of people in America. I know that when people think poverty, they think people of color, but they need to be thinking people with disabilities of all colors because the demographics are very clear in the Census Bureau that people with disabilities are the poorest of the poor, and if you're a person of color with a disability, obviously that's compounded. Um, again, 70% outside of the workforce. Um, and the labor force participation rate is their progress. I talked about the theory of change. You see this line, the blue line, I mean the purple line at the bottom, is the labor force participation rate for people with disabilities. It's getting worse. Things are getting better, not good enough. They're getting better for African Americans, Hispanics, and for women. They are improving. They are substantially higher than the bottom line, which is individuals with disabilities. Um, they need to move faster. Um, so we have them broken down by state, um, so you can get all the data if you're from a different <coughs> member of uh, Congress or Senate's office. We have all the data broken down by state, and you can pull that from the website with this, where this is posted. And we really have to focus on these disconnected youth who are very much at risk for going into the school-to-prison pipeline. And you have to understand that there are places where things are better than others. So if you look at North Dakota, for example, in North Dakota, over 50% of people with disabilities have a job, whereas in Baltimore, only 25% of people with disabilities have a job. 
Now, some people say, well, that's really a racial dynamic because Baltimore is an African American city and South and North Dakota is a white um, area. However, if you really look at the gap between people with and without disabilities and their employment rates, the worst state in the country is actually Maine. Maine has, by a fair amount, the worst numbers in the country for the gap in labor force participation rate. And look at the terrible numbers for some other states that are predominantly white, like Vermont. So you cannot take a look at this data and say this is all about race. There are different policies that you can have that will bring better outcomes, and we need to be moving to those. There are great programs like Project Search and others that enable 70% of people with disabilities to be able to have competitive, integrated employment. I, I'm really proud of the fact that Philip Pauly and uh, our team did tremendous work to find best practices. And in our report, you will find, thanks to Nathan and Max and the entire team that hunted down best practices around the country, lots of different programs that you can investigate. Um, and you can see the demographics of the population um, that is incarcerated. I do think it's important to note that there's a dramatic increase in women who are incarcerated in America, huge increases of women who are incarcerated, and that cognitive disabilities are a massive factor um, in terms of who's incarcerated amongst women. Just going to sort of zip away and forward and bring to the human scale Joseph Heard is an individual who was, was, is deaf. And in jail, he was not given access to appropriate accommodations. So much so that his legal counsel could not communicate with him. He was released from prison and told he could go home to the community because nobody communicated that in American Sign Language he did not know it, and he went back to his prison cell and stayed in prison for another two and a half years before somebody told him that he actually could leave prison. He served an extra two and a half years because nobody gave him his accommodation to let him know that he had served his time. You look at individuals like Paul Schlossinger and Arthur Johnson and Christopher Lopez who all have you know, mental health disorders and whose lives were lost because of the horrific way that people with mental health differences are treated in prison. And I will tell you that one of the most inhumane things is the fact that there's more than 90,000 Americans in solitary confinement at any given moment and that many of them are there because of disabilities. That if somebody is deaf or blind, it is incredibly common that their accommodation is solitary confinement with no interactions with other human beings, as Eddie will talk about in his presentation. <laughs> For Amir Baraka, who testified in this very room, who's dyslexic, you know, really tells the story of somebody who was failed by the system and put into the school to prison, prison pipeline. Criminal justice reform will not succeed unless we address it in all stages of the process. That's the early intervention, it's the adequate accommodations and the ability to learn new skills when people go through the process and the reentry. And so I'm very proud that our team has put together some very specific recommendations, which Jamie's gonna go through, um, that has links to it. But first I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague and co-author, Mr. Eddie Ellis. for having me be a part of this uh, important project. Uh, I'm a was uh, native Washingtonian. I'm very nervous. And um, this is the first time I'm ever talking publicly about my disabilities. That's why I'm nervous. I've talked about my life in other states, but never about my disability. Uh, when I was young, I, I was diagnosed with dyslexia. And uh, I never understood why I saw numbers different, certain words different. And I explained it to my teachers, and most of my teachers just said, just do the work. And my mother wanted to go get me tested again and took the papers to the school. And I never received the help that I needed while I was in school. Uh, for a while when I was young, I was very interested in education, but I lost it. 
because I felt no one would listen to me. You know, I felt different than everyone in school. I felt different the way that I received things and the way that I, you know, did my work. And uh, so around the age of 16, I was locked up uh, for manslaughter in Washington, D.C. I was defending myself um, and I was locked up and someone lost their life. And from that point on, my life changed as I, you know, as I knew it. Um, I didn't want to take anyone's life. Uh, I shouldn't have been in the street. You know, I was suspended from school, from not doing my work, and not being able to follow certain things I was being told. And when I was locked up, I remember the person doing my pre-sentence report, and he said, Eddie's now retarded. Uh, he should be sentenced to uh, the fullest of the law. He would never change again in his life. And it really hurt me a lot because I remember hearing when I was young from certain teachers, you would never be anything. You will never amount to anything. And sometimes when you tell people certain stories, they start to believe it. And I started to believe it, despite of what my mother told me, my grandparents told me, I started to believe the negative things. Uh, I was sentenced uh, to 22 years. I was found guilty of manslaughter, sentenced to 22 years uh, in 1991 when I was 16 years old. And um, I didn't understand, you know, most of the things that was taking place in court. And my lawyer would ask me now, do you understand? And I would say, yeah, because I didn't want to feel like I didn't understand. And I remember, you know, when I was young, I got in a lot of fights, you know, defending myself when people made fun of me, when I didn't understand things in school. So I didn't want to be made fun of again when I was going through this traumatic situation. Uh, while in jail, I got in trouble a lot. Um, certain things I didn't understand. I couldn't get into the education system like I wanted to because jail was very dangerous. And for those who never done time in jail or may have worked on the outside, may see things very different. Jail was very dangerous. The Lord was open, still open in, in Virginia. You know, a lot of people was getting stabbed, assaulted, and, and a lot of other things. And um, while in jail, I tried to go through the education process as, as best as I could. But the teachers that were there, I believe personally that they did their best. But it was a lot of us with the same problems with dyslexia. And a lot of the teachers couldn't educate us the way we needed to be educated. And I don't want to put everything on the teachers, you know, uh, because I believe some of my teachers throughout my life did the best that they could with what they had. And uh, while in jail, uh, I served 15 years uh, and 10 years in solitary confinement. And out of the 10 years in solitary confinement, I did six years in the highest level prison in the United States, the ADX in Florence, Colorado. And uh, while I've been housed at the ADX and other you know, maximum security uh, prisons, I wasn't allowed to do a lot of things. I wasn't allowed to have a lot of materials to read and, right and things of that nature but i started to want to change my life and uh, i don't know what came over me but something did and i wanted to change i wanted to be a better person and i started requesting books i started reading more uh, i took my ged failed it three times you know and it was the math section that i failed three times by one point and I told my teacher, I said, I really think you changed, you know, something on my test, you know, because it's impossible for me to not pass three times by one point, <laughs> you know. So, uh, but while in prison, you know, and been held in solitary confinement, you know, I think my social skills went down the drain. You know, I couldn't really socialize with people. You know, my eyesight started going bad. My long-term vision started going bad because I wasn't using it. And, um, Coming home, I didn't know how to adjust to the community. I didn't know how to use the metro system. I didn't trust people. I didn't want to talk to people. But while I was in jail in 1997, I was assaulted by some correctional officers in private prison in Youngstown, Ohio. And I remember one of the officers said he's having a seizure. And I woke up, blood in my mouth. They took me to the medical unit. Nothing happened. They didn't give me no medication, no test was ran or anything. So 
few years go past, I remember some friends of mine saying, Eddie, I remember you talking to me, and it's like you go into a daze and then come out. And I'm like, man, I'm just thinking about something, but I really don't know what's happening. And I came home in 2006, and I think around 2008, 2009, my, I was in the car with my best friend, and I remember her saying, I'm taking you to the hospital. I'm like, for what? She said, you just had a seizure. And I said, no, I didn't. She said, you going to the hospital, you just had a seizure. So I argued with her that I didn't have a seizure and she saw something else and I went to uh, the hospital in Laurel and they said I have a seizure. I was diagnosed with having epilepsy. You know, and it says in my frontal room. You know, and I'm like, wow. You know, and for me, I felt that, you know, not only do I have a felony on my record, I, I'm now diagnosed with a disability, another disability. And I, and I went into a depression stage for approximately a year, you know, being in denial about what was going on. And uh, I had several seizures after. And now I told myself, I, I, I really have to take this serious. You know, and in 2006, I was diagnosed with a PTSD. And uh, the funny thing about that is, you know, a friend of mine was coming from seeing the doctor, and he was upset. And the counselors uh, were talking to him, but they were scared to really touch him. And, and, I, and I said, what's wrong? And he said, man, they diagnosed me with something called PTSD, you know, and I started laughing. And he said, you know, if I got it, you got it. And I'm like, no, don't give it to me. I don't have it. They said, yeah. <laughs> you know, and the next day, they said I had it when I took my test. And I was in denial. I really didn't want it. I really didn't want it to be diagnosed with, you know, PTSD. So I asked my best friend who was a social worker, you know, send me some books for me. And I was in the program at the time. And she sent me books and I read up on it. And I said, well, the truth of the matter is I do have PTSD. But uh, what happened after reading it, it strengthened me to understand, you know, why I'm going to Safeway, why I'm going to church and having panic attacks. You know, and I went to my doctor one day and I said, man, I went to church and the usher asked me to go in his eye, and when he touched me, I had a panic attack, you know? And he said, well, I'm gonna talk to you about dealing with your panic attacks. And he talked to me about dealing with my panic attacks. But from 1997 to 2006, I never received any medication in jail for seizure. And, um, but I'm, I've been taking it since 1998. I've been taking the medicine. So it's something that, have, that has affected me personally on both levels, with, with having disabilities and with being in prison. And I can tell you personally, I've been in state, federal, private prisons, and no prison I've been in have been equipped to really deal with people with disabilities, but they house people with disabilities. And like Jennifer said, I've seen many people with different disabilities be taken advantage of in jail because they're not protected the way they should be protected. And just because a, people, a person has certain disabilities, they are locked down and put in solitary confinement because of their disability, because the jail is not equipped to hold them. And it's wrong because somebody has a disability that you lock them down and have them locked in the cell and not be able to do what they need to do in these situations. And uh, since I've been home, you know, solitary confinement situation has affected me. In a, in a major way. I mean, I used to eat my dinner, breakfast and lunch, in my room. My mother cooked, I get my food, go in my room. That's what I was used to. Until one day I heard my mother tell my youngest brother, just leave him alone, he's upset. And I, you know, told my mother, I said, Mom, I'm not upset. I said, I, you know, I'm just so used to eating in the cell, that's what I'm continuing to do. And my mother told me, well, you have to get out of that. You know, you have to eat with us. You know, you have to learn to break out of it. You know, and when I came home, you know, I've been blessed to be able to um, step out of, you know, my disabilities, even though I live with them every day, step out of, you know, me being an ex felon. And I've created materials to help people to, that's coming home from prison, you know, to give them information to, you know, fight this situation, because it's hard. It's hard. When you come home, everything moving so fast, you don't know what to do. You don't have the information. When we go in jail, they give you pamphlets to say what not to do. They don't give you anything when you come out to say what you should do. When I came out, they gave me a reentry program of banking skills, and I was broke. 
So it was useless. It was useless. And I can tell you, if I didn't have it in me to fight for myself and to find the people around me to want to help me, my family and other people, I would have been back in prison. I can assure you, I would have been back in prison. You know, but I, I've stayed on course to be my 10th year home, haven't been in trouble. I've created my own organization. I've been, been able to go across the United States and, you know, lecture on different things. I had the opportunity to train probation officers, some lawyers, some social workers, you know, and it, it's something that I've been very proud of, you know, but I can tell you that I don't have a week that I don't deal with my past. And this is something that I don't hold on to in a negative way. I take responsibility for what took place, whether I was protecting myself or not. And each day that I'm able to do something in the community, for me, it's giving back to the person that lost his life, his family, and my community. You know, and I don't do anything out of guilt. I do everything because it's the right thing to do. You know, but I'm here to say that things need to change in the system when it comes to dealing with people with disabilities and when they're coming out of the system. Because when I came out of the system, nobody told me, Eddie, that you had a disability. And because I was in denial to accept the fact that I was diagnosed with dyslexia when I was young. And because I wasn't diagnosed with having seizures and epilepsy when I was in jail because they never tested me. I never accepted it. And it took me almost a year and a half to accept the fact that I had dyslexia. And that it bothers me. And that I forget a lot. And I don't understand why I forget a lot. I try to do a lot of brain teasing things, but I still forget. You know, but I'm here to tell you that this fight is very important. And if we think that we can just fight one part of the criminal justice system when it comes to reentry, we're going to fail. We're going to fail. And when I came home, that was one of my main points. Please help people with disabilities. And I can tell you, most people never listen to me. Most, and I've worked with federal and state parole since I've been home. Most people never listen to me. But now I'm seeing that it's coming to light that people, we need to pay more attention to everybody. But I can tell you that those of us with disabilities are really being looked over in a lot of ways. Thank you. But I've made observations in those 40 years of having worked in New York City, having worked in Colorado and uh, Federal Bureau of Prisons in the White House. I mean, I've had a, a, a wide perspective of this issue. And I'm just so happy that my good, that it turns out my good friend uh, and brilliant Jennifer is going to join part of the hands with others who've been working in this field to elevate this problem because this issue, I'm not going to label it a problem, but an issue that's looking for a solution because I can tell you, Particularly when I was at White Bear Island, so many inmates were there with the highest rate of victimized class. And they didn't report it because they had been abused for so long and so often they didn't even think there was anything wrong with that treatment. And, and that's something that you have to think about. That people have been abused for so long and so often they think that is the way life should go. And we're, we're going to do our best to join with others, to lift the voices up for those who cannot articulate it on their own. So combating the stigma around um, disability, particularly through uh, cultural competence areas, my background is also in social work, and cultural competence is important. You need to know what you're talking about, and particularly when you're talking to someone, you need to convince them that you have some depth of knowledge about it. But these programs will empower parents and caregivers and grandparents, et cetera. And it starts really with, with us in this room, that when you pass someone in the street who's, who's not acting quite the way that we should in our suits and ties and all, don't judge that person because we don't know necessarily what uh, experiences have brought them to that point. And that, okay, yes. Sexual assault and abuse, take steps to address sexual assaults. I, I, I know Eddie could probably give you examples and so can I that it is, it is more pervasive among the disabled. It goes on in prisons and jails without uh, exception. And most of you guys know jails is a 
short-term detention uh, stay where you're going through the court process, and prisons are the place that you go to serve longer uh, periods of, of, of time. Technically, it's a year and a day it counts as a, as a prison. So one of the things that we talk about is how do we address the issue of sexual assault. One is to let people know that they should be free from that behavior. And that if you are violated, if someone touches you, I don't care how little or tall you are, in a way that makes you feel uncomfortable, then that's more, that's boring on the issue of sexual uh, uh, misbehavior that, that is unwanted. And then it progresses uh, in, in, in more so, if you will. So what are those things that we need to do to continue to bring light to it and then find remedies? And I won't read the ones that are there because you can read for yourself, but they're excellent. Um, uh, her team um, has gone about, Jennifer and, and uh, Philip and her team have really uh, included some excellent, excellent resources that I would ask you uh, to follow up on. Definitely reforming the broken educational policy. I'll just use an example. When my son was a little guy, um, they believed he was dyslexic. Now, he liked to read, but he couldn't, comp comprehension was an issue. Loved to read, but comprehension. So we went to the counselor, and they immediately wanted to put him in, a, a, label him as having uh, an, a problem, and put him in a certain category. Well, you know, I'm reasonably educated, reasonably uh, aggressive when it came to my kids. So I fought that. I, I was able to fight that successfully. But I thought about all the other parents lined up in the hall who didn't have a wherewithal, whose kids were put in the slow track, who were labeled immediately without even taking the steps, as you said, that could preclude that. I mean, Jennifer did wonderful things with, with uh, one of her children to mitigate those circumstances. And if there's intervention early enough, so those are the things that we need to do uh, to, to offset the negative impacts on students, particularly students with, of, of color, and uh, the two are intersecting without uh, question, disability and, and uh, color. Improve mentorship programs and expand early work experiences to power youth with disability. I sum that up as saying everybody needs to be successful at something. Everybody needs to have something that they can say, I do this well. Everyone needs to feel good about themselves and treat me that is through some expression of work, whether it's art or whatever it is. But we all need to be successful in some areas. And one of the ways that we do that is by saying, I'm going to find you the help that you need, to uh, provide you with the resources, <coughs> and whatever that turns to be. And again, I would ask you to refer you to the excellent resources in the different programs that they uh, outlined here. I won't read them to you, but they're, they're there and they're Many times uh, when I was with the Bureau of Prisons, and we would ask people to help, and they would, and I'd say, great, you know, why are you doing this? And they said, well, nobody's ever asked me before. So you would be amazed at what you're able to uh, access by simply just reaching out, looking for the assistance that you need. This one is so important, ending criminalization of homelessness. Uh, I, I fail to understand how not being able to have a home Maslow's theory of high hierarchic needs for those of you who have got social psych background. The first thing you need to maintain human life is shelter. So most people who are, are aware of their circumstances know that they need shelter. So people don't necessarily intentionally become homeless. So how do we combat that? How do we stop criminalizing and sweeping the streets? I mean, I can almost guarantee you Cleveland, and where's the other one, Philadelphia? They're going to sweep the streets. They're going to take all the homeless, and Charlie will know this, take the others in here. They're going to sweep the streets of all the people who are labeled undesirable. And the first group, primarily, are the homeless, and they're going to be in the prisons, and, and the jails, rather, and they're going to be detained, or held, or given bus tickets, or all the other strategies that different municipalities use. I know of what I speak. I've seen it, I've experienced it, and it still exists. So what we need to do is decriminalize it. First of all, it shouldn't be even considered the fact that you're a domicile breaks no law in the world that I understand. Reform policing, and I think that there have been a number of things that have occurred in the last four or five years that have said we need to change the way we police in general and specifically with the, uh, with the disabled. 
in the 70s, the mental hygiene law changed that said, you can no longer be held against your will if you're not a threat to yourself or someone else. So if you know about St. Elizabeth or other parts of it, uh, where you come from. That changed. So what happened? The mental institution dumped out, and I mean dumped, into the streets thousands of people who had never been on their own before. And so what the legislation required was for the resources, community resource centers to be open to treat the people who are now in the community. It did not happen. In some places, they were more successful than others. But in the larger urban areas, these people were just dumped on the street with no resources, not knowing how to fend for themselves. Many of them had been in there their whole lives, had no family contact. So it's no mystery that they left the prisons and jails and then found themselves on the streets, not understanding, as Jennifer said, complex uh, orders or even the basics, found themselves arrested coming back into the jails. And in the 70s and the 80s, there used to be a big slogan, the jails and prisons are the new mental institutions. So it's not just the mental capability issue now. It's also the physical, uh, mental impairment. There are all the, the disability factors are now emerging because all of these issues are now coming into uh, the criminal justice system and have been for, for quite a while. Let just uh, juvenile justice lead somewhere. And I love the way this is phrased because what it generally is, it's a pipeline. They're feeders. Um, there was a study done, I think it was by the National Policy Institute. Um, they're zip codes. We know exactly where the people come from who come into our jails and prisons. They're, they're zip codes that keep this beast called the criminal justice system going. And now that there are for, for profit, and I'm, I'm a capitalist at heart, I have a business, I'm not opposed to that. But now that the profit market motive has been introduced into criminal justice, I think many of you may know of the judge up in Pennsylvania who was sentenced to 28 years because he was sentencing young people to a, a prison that he was an investor. So if you think that's an isolated incident, it isn't. There are policies that have been enacted and influenced by people who benefit from them. So juvenile justice should not be a feeder system. Juvenile justice should not be the track that you get promoted from being in a juvenile facility to an adult facility. And we say school to pipeline. Uh, I think the Children's uh, Children Defense Fund talks about from the crib from being a kid all the way up to becoming uh, captured by the, the criminal justice system. Because if you ingest lead, and many people who live in low-income circumstances live in older places, so they don't get the services, I mean, so they go from there from school, from literally being in the crib, eating into school, not being able to function, to juvenile justice, and then up to the adult system. We know exactly where most of the people who are going to come into our jails and prisons, where they come from. And I, I don't think we're going to talk about felony disenfranchisement, but believe me, prisoners have a value beyond just the compensation that people are paid. When I was in the Bureau of Prisons, we had communities putting together amazing campaigns to get us to build in their community, not just because it brought jobs, it brought votes. Because the way the legislation in most is written now, the person incarcerated gets counted as part of the residents of that community. So don't think that it's just about the dollars and cents in terms of compensation, but there are greater aspects of it too. Not from the person originated where they originate from. They get counted in the census for that local jurisdiction. But I won't talk about that so much today, but that's something that uh, I think we'll, we'll need to just leave it down. But you know, this part is okay. Alternative sentencing, it makes sense for so many, expand alternative, it makes sense for so many reasons. Jails and prisons are expensive places. I left New York City in 19, fiscal year, 19, uh, fiscal year 1991, actually. It costs New York City, which is a, it's an outlier, $90,000 a year to maintain a prisoner. Oh, it's an average all the time. Now think about that. That was, what, 25 years or so ago. Imagine what that kind of 
uh, investment could do in another area. So jails and prisons are expensive, and they don't lead to the outcome that alternative sentencing leads to. You can get youth, and, and, and particularly with the youth, there's behavioral changes that can be modified at an earlier age, at an earlier institution, as we just were doing. And if that's the dollars that we do in incarceration, in, as opposed to that. Reforming the courts uh, requires looking to ways for wrongful convictions, false confessions, confessions rather. It goes the, uh, the gamut in terms of particularly the criminal justice system. You have understand the charges against them and just as you said many of them don't want to acknowledge it so they'll go yes I understand you stand before the judge it's a plea bargain which by the way 90% of cases in criminal courts at least here in the District of Columbia are plea bargain and when you go to trial and if you don't plea bargain the penalties are generally more severe so many prisoners will uh, defendants will accept a plea bargain and not even understand the conditions under which. So there's lots of areas, I mean, there's a whole spectrum that we can talk about in terms of uh, a form, reforming the criminal justice, uh, reforming the court system. Reducing solitary confinement and chemical constraints. When you said you went to Florence, when I was working for the Federal Bureau, I got to travel throughout the, the United States visiting all the prisons and jails. The one place I would not go was Florence because of the rate of challenges that existed in that place because it was almost all solitary confinement. Almost all solitary confinement, which we know through research injures that person. And the longer they're in, the greater that injury to that person's ability, if you said long-term vision, ability to interact, all the things that we say we need prisoners to do and returning citizens to do upon release, we struggle on that. And Florence serves a purpose because there are some people, and I'll say this and whatever you react, I hope never walk the face of an outside world again. I'm sorry. There are some people who are just so asocial and just cannot be anywhere I want to be at least, I'll put it that way, just for their safety and ours. That should be. So there, there are places that, that exist for that reason. But I would say 99.5% of the people who are in prisons and in institutions like that should come home, need to come home, but need the uh, resources. And solitary and chemical strength just uh, isolates that particular behavior for that moment, but not for the long, longer time. Okay, I think um, accommodations, particularly in court. Um, I think it's a common practice now to hire an interpreter, but many times it's a language issue. And a person with disability coming from another country, I mean, just gets layered on the fact that they not only don't understand the language, I'm coming here, if you will, but they don't have interpreters that can get the nuances of what happens to them when uh, they're in court. So again, there are lots of resources there. And the issue of training, Many of the correction officers, and I was on the policy side, I was not on the uniform side, they really do want to do, they want to do their job, go home, have a good day. Many of them, if they have the training, if the expression goes, when you know better, you do better. I've met some really outstanding people who really try to take, make the extra step, but they've not had the training. So we need to give not only the, uh, the returning citizens, but the staff as well, the training that uh, they need. Release on day one, start planning for their release. The moment they come into the system, and knowing that they will be coming back to the community. Assessments, or it's called uh, also classification, the best predictor for learning about a person is learning what are their deficits, what are the things that we need to start putting in place. And different uh, jurisdictions have different capacity. New York City, had lots of resources. Most jails in this country are less than 50 people. So when you talk about assessment coming in, that's a small facility. They may not be able to have it, but there are people in the community who, if you ask to come in and provide services, can. So there's no reason not to do an assessment because you don't have the resources. There are resources available in, in, uh, in most uh, communities. 
uh, expand, I'm sorry, extend and expand capacity through NGO non-governmental supports focused on providing re-entry solutions for returning citizens. Uh, heading up the uh, National Office of Citizens Protection Officer was building public-private partnerships. So there are many people in communities that will come into facilities and provide the service, but first we have to reach out and ask them, nonprofits, for that, because many times we don't ask, we just assume that those services are there. Critical, collect and use better data. We make assumptions that we know what the nature of the problem is, but, I mean, you guys did an amazing job. I thought I knew a lot, but what I learned is that it's a moving ball and it keeps changing and we have to continue moving along with it, collecting the data so that we'll be clear when we offer po uh, public policy options that we're standing on firm ground. Uh, engaging employers, that's critical. Everybody has to need to say self-work, self-work through work. And one of the things that we can do to uh, earn income tax credits, there are lots of different programs, if you will, that are available, but many times we're just not uh, aware of them. So recruiting employee, employees, but also very importantly, giving them the information they need in order to effectively serve, uh, service the, uh, the disability community, okay? Fun, innovative uh, recidivism. I'm a big proponent of something called the public health model that says that this punitive system that we've had for these 150, 300 years how we've had criminal justice the model isn't working. It's not working. So the public health model says, let's look at the, and I won't get into all of it, but just I would refer you to, it. There, are, there are other options available to us that are more effective and there's data to support that, that cost less, and they injure the, all the parties who are involved less as well. Second chance is not three strikes. Uh, there's second chance legislation that says returning citizens need to have the support. One of them is changing the law as it re results, uh, as, uh, as it affects public housing. In some jurisdictions, if you are released, you can't go home to your family. And you then join the ranks of the homeless because there are, there are uh, policies in effect that preclude certain uh, charges, certain convictions of people with certain from so you almost set up that person uh, for failure to, uh, to return. So with that, I will end, and we are taking questions, or there's within the board questions. School districts are now requiring uh, disability screening to be done between, between the ages of the grades K through three. I was wondering if there's any data on this reducing uh, violations of... So the, the question is, is there data to show that the early screening um, will actually reduce um, criminal involvement? Um, so a lot of that, it takes time for such things to have an impact, and I haven't seen a study that directly does show that, but there are a lot of studies that show failure to complete high school does strongly correlate with, the court, with entering the, the justice system, um, and one of the largest reasons that people fail to complete school is because they are having this frustration from the lack of uh, disability assessments, accommodations and appropriate support. So I think in states that are doing that, they will see um, a significant decrease in crime and that they will see a significant um, improvement in outpoint uh, in terms of capable citizens who are working in jobs and they're becoming taxpayers. Jennifer, you said one of the surprises of the report was the 30.9% of prisoners who have cognitive disabilities. Could you expand on that? What, what was counted as a cognitive disability? Um, why do you think the numbers are high? And, and what's some of the, uh, uh, what's some of the impact on that? So I think that, first of all, it's 30% of those with disabilities have, um, have cognitive impairment. So not 30% of all prisoners, but 30% of all prisoners who have disabilities um, report it. One of the problems is that we think that it's far larger than that. Um, because the way that the um, data is collected is a self-reporting without there being an independent assessment. And particularly in minority communities, there are disincentives from wanting to be labeled. As, as Janie said, that you know, in a lot of communities, if 
you get the disability label, they put you in the slow class and a segregated class, not an inclusive class that's going to um, you know, move you forward. So um, we think it's far larger than that. It doesn't, it has to be um, the ability to remember could be in there. I mean, some of them might have early Alzheimer's or dementia. Some of it might be mental health disorder. But you do see that more than 10% have an intellectual disability. Um, and we just don't know, but I suspect that these environmental issues like lead paint, like fetal alcohol syndrome, um, in addition to things like autism and Down syndrome and other things that are not environmentally or that we don't know to be environmentally caused, um, are very, very significant factors um, for those who are in prison. This is a question for Eddie. Uh, what were some of the first steps you took on uh, getting back on your feet uh, after leaving prison, and what would you say was the most instrumental for you? Uh, I, I, Can you use the mic, I think for me, um, my mother has been very, very uh, instrumental in my success. Uh, my best friend, um, he's been my friend since I was 10. You know, uh, I met a lot of probation officers that I've become close to over the years. Um, it's been helpful. Uh, my now wife has been very helpful to me. and. Um, Jane has been very helpful to me in a lot of ways, and I think I got to give myself credit also, you know, because um, I know that I wasn't raised that way, and um, I've done a lot of wrong things, but for me, what helped me when I came home was that I knew that I wanted to change, and I knew I had to surround myself around different people to help me get where I need to go, and I did that, you know. Um, I achieved my GED when I came home. I started going to college online. But when I had my son, I had to stop going to college online. But um, I think the positive people around me really, really pushed me to uh, really open up and let go of you know the shame, the doubt, and things of that nature. And that's what helped me be the person I am today. And all those people you kept contact with during your sentence? Yes. Yes. Oh, well, my judge that sentenced me, um, we did a panel with Georgetown Death Penalty class a few years ago. And he's never sat on the panel with anybody that he sentenced. And um, when he came to the school, some of the kids were like, you know, what would Eddie, Eddie do? How he react? And things of that nature. So when the judge came, he read my pre sentence report and was saying everything the lady said. And he said, I'm very proud to say that that person was wrong. Because Eddie's proven that person wrong years ago, even when he was in jail. You know, and my judge, um, I sent him my certificates over the years to show him my success. And when I came home, I, you know, it was an honor for me to be able to sit down and do a panel with him just around the criminal justice period. But to have my judge say that, you know, he's very proud to see that I've changed my life and given back to the community and meant a lot to me. So, yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Harvey Kucha from Center Manning's office. And this question from Ms. Jeffers. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, solutions that you uh, put forth was reforming policing practices and the use, uh, some of the use of force policies that police officers might use. Uh, how would you recommend uh, approaching that? Would that be like a government standpoint or from a nonprofit standpoint? How to approach the issue. The question is how to approach the issue of reforming policing policy. Yes, ma'am. question, okay? It has to be collaborative. The silos in which we find comfort in them ourselves live mostly aren't effective. So it's all, it's, it's a 360 ecosystem. It is, it is government, it is nonprofits, it is individuals, it is all who have our stakeholders in seeing this country be what it could be on that area. I, I truly believe that. The other is that we just need to reach out more. Um, I think one of the things that I just wrote a paper for my school, Howard, where my research showed how many creative people are doing wonderful things, but they're doing them individually. So until we start collaborating, cooperating, that it does, you don't have to be the lead, you can just be one of the people in there. So to answer your question, it's all. It is nonprofit, it's elected officials, it is individuals, it is all of us who have a stake in the system, and we all do 
to make that, that change and step out and, 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 and demand it, absolutely demand it. Um, to add on to his question about training correctional officers, um, after I read your draft, um, I was looking at a report by Human Rights at Home regarding co-responding, co-response teams, and how that can help reduce escalation and how you can place a clinician with a police officer when um, a prisoner has a mental health um, issue. So I was wondering if that has been shown to be effective because the research, like Human Rights Home, did have direct statistics. So I was wondering if that has been implemented in terms of you see if it has been effective. Are you talking directly to me or? I'm like Say again? Oh, okay. Um, one of the things that we know can work is, and, and this really is the role of the police officer, is to de-escalate the situation. When they're called in, that is their real purpose, and many of them will tell you, they're called, they're not there to make it worse, it's to make it better. But I've said before, many of them don't have the, the training. So at one time, <coughs> Uh, and I think it was Multnomah County, I can't remember, but it was in Oregon, that they would send out a mental health, a trained mental health person with every call that came in indicating there was someone in crisis. And I do not remember the data in particular, but I remember that it was encouraging that they had fewer um, shootings, they had fewer attacks on officers because that person helped stabilize the de-escalate the situation and then after that you can be more uh, effective so I would be a big proponent of doing that now can you do it everywhere no but you can provide the training at least so that people are aware this person is not acting out of malice they're not in control of, of their faculties a lot I guess a lot of your focus was on uh, returning citizens you know so students or early 20s, uh, a, a lot of the uh, returning citizens that people work with in pet living centers and other places uh, are in their 30s, 40s, 50s. Eddie is an exceptional case, you know, more, more power to you, but what sort of solutions are there for you know, your, your older, you know, middle-aged returning citizens who you know, perhaps can't take advantage of a lot of the uh, uh, options that are out there for uh, younger people you know, in their teens and 20s. Uh, for me, I came home when I was 31, so I was in the middle of that old and younger. So I think it needs to be more program. It's not enough program. Even the younger people fall off. You got people from 16 to 18, 18 to 21, that fall through the cracks. Just like you have the older ones fall through the cracks. I think it needs to be more programs available for people with different ages. Because you go to people with high ages, you deal with more physical, you know, disabilities, and you're getting older and you got a lot of things that's wrong with you that younger people may not have wrong with them. But I think that, you know, for me, I have service from 16 to 60 when it came to dealing with people who was coming home, giving them information, helping them get where they need to go and things that nature, but it needs to be more program. It's more program focuses more on young people because they release a second chance act and spend more money to work with younger people than it is older people. But I think we need to be a more focus on older people also because statistically, it's gonna be a lot more older people being released from the Bureau of Prisons than it is young people. So if I can add on to what Eddie said, and I totally agree with everything that he has said, um, in our report, we talk a lot about what Janie mentioned, which is capacity building within the system. There is a huge problem of capacity. So I'll give you an example. So I live in the state of Maryland, and in the state of Maryland, um, if you are leaving school and you have a disability, there's supposed to be a transition plan to help you get a job. If you acquire a new disability, you can, in theory, go to a one-stop shop or a, you know, a, a, you know, a place and ask for support to help get a job. Today, the wait list in the state of Maryland is 18 months, 18 months before you get served. And so you have this problem. If you're a young person with a disability and you're leaving school, you've got these really good, what I call, get-up-and-go skills. 
you know, you get up in the morning, you get dressed, you look fresh, you look job ready, and you're ready to like show up someplace on time. If you wait 18 months sitting on your parents' couch waiting for your first meeting to go to a vocational rehabilitation officer who's then going to say to you, I'd like to see your resume, and you say, well, the last 18 months I sat on my parents' couch, that certainly is not going to help you. So the state of Maryland is rightfully very concerned about criminal justice reform and like the federal level is looking to enable people, particularly nonviolent offenders who have who've been involved in these excessive sentences to come home. I just came from um, Senator Cornyn was giving a talk over at AEI about his new proposals along with others to reduce the sentences. So in Maryland they reduce the sentences so you have these people who have three strikes you're out, and they are drug offenders, and they're in for these long sentences. So now 1,800 people are going to get out. It doesn't sound like that many people, 1,800 people, but the waiting months of 18 months is actually only 3,600 people in the state of Maryland. That's how slow it is to get services that it takes 18 months to get through those 3,600 um, potential cases. So I know this sounds like a lot of details, but the thing is, the best practices are that the second somebody comes out of incarceration, it should be hand in glove for community services. Hand in glove. If you have them go out and they have no access to medication and they have a mental health difference, if they have no access to have public housing, and as Jamie pointed out, um, their parent lives in public housing that says, people with a conviction for X can't live there. So now they can't live with their parents or their sister or their brother because they're literally forbidden from living in that place. And they're homeless now. And they have no access to someone to help them find a job. Now what are you going to do? Where are you going to put them in line? Already the line was 18 months long. Now are you going to say, well, it's so important for the person coming out of prison to get services that they now go to the front of the line so the person who has a disability that just finished high school or just finished you know whatever schooling they're going to do but didn't commit a crime is now put to the back of the line how are you going to handle that in maryland today in my county montgomery county 25 percent of the jobs for being a case manager are actually open why? Because to be a job coach in this situation, you need a college degree, you need certain experience, and essentially it's like a licensing situation to be able to coach these people, and they're paying $12 an hour. So who, with all of those credentials, wants to take a job that pays $12 an hour? So that means that there are people that could be, I mean, in theory, you could handle there's more technical job slots, but people who have the legal qualifications to take the job are not going to take that job. So that makes the waiting list even longer and the case coast, case load even larger for the other people. So a good deal of our report does talk about the need for these nonprofit organizations, as Jane mentioned, to really play a role for faith-based organizations. There are a number of organizations, Phil Polly and our team put in a, no a number of different nonprofits that are doing very good work. But those nonprofits tend not to be putting the disability lens into the work that they're doing. So that they're saying, well, we need to up somebody's literacy, but they're not recognizing, well, that individual has executive function disorder or dyslexia. There are ways to help people with those issues learn how to read successfully, let's use that way and not a way that isn't going to work. So there are a number of things that you'll see in the report. There's a huge number of links. I really encourage you to go online and read the report. It's much better to read it online than a hard copy and, and it was emailed out. Hopefully all of you got it. It's on your computers when you go back because there are so many links in this document that are linking to successful programs or promising practices. A lot of work went into finding those programs and linking to them so that you can investigate other resources. And I just want to say that this is a great team. And I was really honored to work on this with Philip, with Janie, with Eddie, to have Evelyn um, moderate this. We have a team of fellows at Respectability that's extraordinary. We're a new nonprofit organization. Um, we are almost three years old. 
We have only five people on staff, only five people on staff. We have so many people that are volunteers. If anyone here is interested in being engaged in these issues, we are looking for volunteers. We are looking for partners. If you think, after reading the report, that there's something that you know that we are missing, please email us and let us know, because we are just learning as much as we can, as quickly as possible, so that we can get the word out. Um, a lot of you, even the ones that are incredibly young, are in incredibly important jobs and roles. And if you're an intern and you can take this information back to the legislative assistant that is working on these issues, you can make a really profound difference. And so I want to congratulate those of you who took the time to spend um, 90 minutes to learn more about these issues. I mean, we just came from a meeting with Senator um, Corn, who, you know, he's been working on justice issues for decades. And yet he said he really doesn't know much about disability and um, the criminal justice system. He's interested, very interested in learning more. And I think that's probably true about all of, um, all of your members and senators. So, so thank you all very much.